Today's topic is Lysander Spooner and the American Letter Mail Company. You may not have ever heard about Lysander Spooner. He's a very interesting guy, though. In 1808, he was born, which makes him about the same age as Robert E. Lee and Abraham Lincoln. We don't know a lot about his early life. He became a lawyer in 1833, but in 1844, he started a company called the American Letter Mail Company to deliver letters between several cities on the East Coast. And the reason he did this was that in 1844, the post office was charging 14 and a half cents on average to deliver a letter. That doesn't seem like a lot, but at the time, coins were made out of silver. And 14 and a half cents was equivalent to about three and a half grams of silver. Now today, the price of silver fluctuates quite a bit, but it's in the general neighborhood of $30 an ounce over the last couple of years, which means that in today's dollars, it cost about $3.50 to deliver a letter in 1844. That's obviously a lot more than what we pay now, so where was that extra money going? Well, in a large, to a large extent, it was going to the politically connected. And the way this works was that politicians would give special treatment to certain people or certain companies in respect to the post office. So a transportation company that had political allies might get to deliver the mail. Or a family member of a politician might get one of the comfortable jobs that at the post office where there was very little risk of losing your job. But Lysander Spooner came along in 1844 and said that he could lower the rates, and he did. He charged a lot lower prices to deliver mail in these cities. The post office argued that what he was doing was unconstitutional. It said that Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gave the post office or the Congress the sole right, the sole uh, the exclusive right to operate a mail delivery business in the United States. Lysander Spooner, however, pointed out that Article 1, Section 8 only gives Congress the power to do it. It doesn't give them the exclusive power to do it. He argued that anyone could run a mail company, not just the United States federal government. However, in 1845, Congress passed a law obviously disagreeing with Lysander Spooner, that closed some loopholes that had allowed Lysander Spooner to stay in business. So in 1845, Lysander Spooner was forced out of business by the government. The payment of taxes being compulsory, of course, furnishes no evidence that anyone voluntarily supports the Constitution. One. It is true that the theory of our Constitution is that all taxes are paid voluntarily, that our government is a mutual insurance company, voluntarily entered into by the people with each other, that each man makes a free and purely voluntary contract with all others who are party to the Constitution, to pay so much money for so much protection, the same as he does with any other insurance company, and that he is just as free not to be protected and not to pay tax as he is to pay a tax and be protected. But this theory of our government is wholly different from the practical fact. The fact is that the government, like a highwayman, says to a man, your money or your life. And many, if not most, taxes are paid under the compulsion of that threat. The government does not indeed waylay a man in a lonely place, spring upon him from the roadside, and holding a pistol to his head, proceed to rifle his pockets. But the robbery is nonetheless a robbery on that account, and it is far more dastardly and shameful. The highwayman takes solely upon himself the responsibility, danger, and crime of his own act. He does not pretend that he has any rightful claim to your money, or that he intends to use it for your own benefit. He does not pretend to be anything but a robber. 
he has not acquired impudence enough to profess to be merely a protector, and that he takes men's money against their will merely to enable him to protect those infatuated travelers who feel perfectly able to protect themselves or do not appreciate his peculiar system of protection. He is too sensible a man to make such professions as these. Furthermore, having taken your money, he leaves you as you wish him to do. He does not persist in following you on the road against your will, assuming to be your rightful sovereign on the account of the protection he affords you. He does not keep protecting you by commanding you to bow down and serve him, by requiring you to do this and forbidding you to do that, by robbing you of more money as often as he finds it in his interest or pleasure to do so, and by branding you as a rebel, a traitor, and an enemy of your country, and shooting you down without mercy if you dispute his authority or resist his demands. He is too much of a gentleman to be guilty of such impostures and insults and villainies as these. In short, he does not, in addition to robbing you, attempt to either make you his dupe or his slave. The proceedings of those robbers and murderers who call themselves the government are directly the opposite of these of the single highwaymen. In the first place, they do not, like him, make themselves individually known, or consequently take upon themselves personally the responsibility of their acts. On the contrary, they secretly, by secret ballot, designate some one of their number to commit the robbery in their behalf, while they keep themselves practically concealed. They say to the person thus designated, Go to A, B, and say to him that the government has need of money to meet the expenses of protecting him and his property. If he presumes to say that he has never contracted with us to protect him, and that he wants none of our protection, say to him that that is our business and not his, that we choose to protect him, whether he desires us to do so or not, and that we demand pay, too, for protecting him. If he dares to inquire who the individuals are who have thus taken upon themselves the title of the government, and who assume to protect him, and demand payment of him, without his ever having made any contract with them, say to him that that too is our business, and not his, that we do not choose to make ourselves individually known to him, that we have secretly, by secret ballot, appointed you our agent to give him notice of our demands, and if he complies with them to give him in our name a receipt that will protect him against any similar demand for the present year. If he refuses to comply, seize and sell enough of his property to pay not only our demands, but all your own expenses and trouble besides. If he resists the seizure of his property, call upon the bystanders to help you. Doubtless, some of them will prove to be members of our band. If, in defending his property, he should kill any of our band who are assisting you, capture him at all hazards charge him in one of our courts with murder, convict him, and hang him. If he should call upon his neighbors, or any others who, like him, may be disposed to resist our demands, and they should come in large numbers to his assistance, cry out that they are all rebels and traitors, that our country is in danger, call upon the commander of our hired murderers, tell him to quell the rebellion and save the country, cost what it may. Tell him to kill all who resist, though they should be hundreds of thousands, and thus strike terror into all others similarly disposed. See that the work of murder is thoroughly done, that we may have no further trouble of this kind hereafter. When these traitors shall have thus been taught our strength and our determination, they will be good, loyal citizens for many years, and pay their taxes without a why or a wherefore. It is under such compulsion as this that taxes, so-called, are paid, and how much proof the payment of taxes affords that the people consent to support the government, it needs no further argument to show.